Hey guys, how's it going? So today's tutorial is going to be on a really advanced and important topic that is how to run a DFT calculation for a nanocluster or a molecule such as carbon dioxide right here. So this is a very important question that a lot of users ask me regarding how to do, you know, perform this calculation and especially using Quantum Espresso, which is a plain wave based code. Now, if you are you know familiar with DFT then you might know that there are several codes that implement DFT in their own way so there are Gaussian, Turbomol and um, Orca, Quantum Espresso, Wasp etc. Now the difference between Gaussian based codes and you know Quantum Espresso type of codes is that of the basis set. So Quantum Espresso and Wasp use a plain wave basis set which is especially useful when you are running calculations regarding periodic systems. Uh, such as the ones that we have been doing up till now in the tutorial. So in the tutorials we have been running calculations on a Fe crystal, on a silicon crystal. So they are periodic systems and that is where the importance of plane waves comes because plane waves give you an added advantage when, uh, you know, in the computational cost whenever you are running the calculation for a periodic system. However, when you are running a calculation for a molecule such as carbon dioxide or a nanocluster such as this then the uh, basis set that is more suitable for such a problem is a you know atom centered basis set so the plane wave basis sets are not basically localized anywhere so they are you know continuously and uh, they have their probability all over the place however the Gaussian based waves uh, basis sets or any other such uh, basis set which is which has a look uh, which is localized at the atom center then they have advantages uh, when you are running calculation using a molecule or a nanocluster because there you don't have you know a continuous array of atoms you only have atoms in certain positions in the space and you want your basis set to have their probabilities only there so that is a major difference now uh, this tutorial keep in mind is not about running calculations on nanoclusters or molecules using a local or uh, you know local atom center basis set because that is trivial if you're using a you know software such as Gaussian, Turbomol, Orca etc. However this tutorial is about running a DFT calculation using a plane wave basis set on a nanocluster or a molecule so that is it so that's uh, what I wanted to clear. So now when it comes to Quantum Espresso or WASP or maybe even Siesta then um, what these softwares typically do is whenever you are you know providing an input file um, then you know uh, it's usually in the form of a whenever you are creating an input file you usually have to I mean you absolutely have to provide certain information such as about the Bravais lattice so you provide information about the Bravais lattice and the lattice parameter etc and the reason you need to do that is because what these codes essentially do is um, let me just open one real quick so let me just go ahead and open a um, dot .zip file using BRI. So as you can see this is a solid state crystal of a gallium arsenide and what you can see here is it has cubic lattice and each lattice parameter is about 5.65 angstrom. Now what these codes such as Quantum Espresso, CS, etc are going to do is they are going to you know replicate these and apply the periodic conditions therefore uh, for every atom here there will be a periodic image over here after 5.65 angstrom and then another periodic image so what they are doing is they are using the periodic boundary conditions and all the periodicity based um, formulations to really bring the calculation time down and perform these calculations for periodic systems hence the name periodic codes if you must have heard that quantum stress is a periodic DFT code or wasp is a periodic DFT code etc so these are really useful whenever you are running a calculation for a you know large system which has some periodic element to it however whenever you are running a calculation on carbon dioxide and or a nano cluster then the problem is you obviously don't have any lattice but in order to run a calculation on a quantum espresso or periodic code then you still have to provide some lattice parameters or Bravais lattice information. Now how are you going to do that? So the reason uh, you have to provide these is because the code needs that because it's going to use the periodic boundary conditions and make its periodic images but you don't want to do that. You only want to run a calculation on a single CO2 molecule and see how it 
works you don't want an array of co2 molecules of course now there is one workaround then you can do and thus enabling you to run a calculation on a molecule or a nanocluster so of course you are going to provide the latest information and also let me just do one thing here so since i'm using bri for the you know visualization now you can notice that even though here we have some lattice information it's not showing them because it is a dot xyz file so what we are going to do is we are going to go in designer and um, enable show cell now okay now coming back so the workaround for running the calculations on a molecule is we are still going to be using a lattice but what we are going to do is we are going to make the you know, unit cell so large that it is essentially going to be non-interacting with its periodic images. So let's say, um, for example, BRAI, what it does is it is a GUI quantum express. I'm sure you must be familiar because I have been making tons of videos on it already. Anyhow, uh, you can still follow the tutorial even if you don't use BRI because essentially I'm be talking about the principles and BRI is, is only for visualization and input file creation purposes only. But the principles are still going to be the same. Anyhow, so what BRI does a uh, few tasks for you is, um, sorry, uh, what BRI does for you is that um, whenever you open a .xyz file it recognizes that it's, of course it's a molecule so you don't want to be you know you are running a periodic um, calculation on it so what it does already is and what you also need to do even if you are not using BRI this is a very more very important essential step so what you're going to do is you are going to create a unit cell or provide a ladder so large that it is essentially non interacting with this periodic images so let's say the CO2 molecule was placed in a cubic lattice of um, let's say five angstrom um, this um, lattice parameter and also let me just go ahead and translate the atoms a little bit um, so I'll go to the modeler and translate it I'm sorry um, initialize model and then um, along the y-axis all right so here we are and then slightly along the x-axis Okay, so and don't you know really be bothered? Don't really get bothered by by all what I'm doing here. It's only for visualization purposes, and doesn't really matter to do these translations or anything like that. So I'm um, sorry. I'll have to do one more because you know this is what quantum espresso does actually. So actually, I'll just keep it like this because this exactly shows what quantum espresso does. So. What quantum espresso is going to do when you give a cubic lattice of a 5 angstrom lattice parameter then it's going to create images of CO2 at every 5 angstrom. Now what this is going to do is when you are going to run a calculation it is going to res give results as if you know CO2 there were plenty CO2 atoms um, molecules uh, that 5 angstrom are so it's going to be like a sea of CO2 atoms. But we don't want a lot of CO2 atoms. We want to. We only want to run a calculation on a single CO2 atom. Now, what if we make this lattice parameter so large that essentially um, the calculations that are run are, um, you know, the CO2 molecules will be so far apart that they won't be affecting each other. And that is essentially the most important step while running a nanocluster, you know, molecule calculation using the FD. That is to figure out how large a unit cell you need or how large a vacuum region you need between the periodic images of the molecules or the nanoclusters such that their interactions don't occur. Now one way to find this is very easy that is I mean usually you know research papers if you look at the literature then what they do is they just say that uh, the periodic images were separated by a you know vacuum region of at least 15 angstrom however you can even find out so I think that is a good number however you can even do so by yourself by running different SCF calculations at 15 angstrom distance and then 12 angstrom distance and then uh, 10 angstrom lattice parameters so that is essentially going to give the distance between the uh, periodic images and you will notice that the energies as you go larger uh, you know in the distance or the vacuum region then the energies will stop getting you know changing so uh, let's say you ran a calculation at 5 angstrom distance and you got some energy but then when you run the 
same calculation 10 angstrom that the energy will change drastically because in the previous case it was getting a lot of interactions and then those interactions have reduced now but let's say you then ran a calculation on 15 angstrom and you got some energy and then you ran the calculation at 20 angstrom and you got the energy again but this time the energies regarding uh, you know corresponding to the 15 angstrom vacuum and the 20 angstrom vacuum if they are not very different then that means that 15 angstrom vacuum was enough to reduce all the interactions of the periodic images so that was the most important step one of you know running the periodic images or periodic dft um, I'm sorry, of running the nanocluster uh, molecule calculations using periodic DFT codes. Now, the second important part is when you come to the SCF calculation, then um, most of the things are going to remain similar to the you know, bulk calculations. You will need to figure out the cutoff for wave functions similarly. And even you can use the cutoff for wave function that you use for the bulk systems. However, that is not really, uh, you know, uh, in principle, it should be different. However, um, I think it can be, you know, it's still going to work. So you can use the cutoff for wave function that you figure out for your, you know, bulk atom is going to be similar to that. And similar is for the cutoff for charge. However, the next major difference to the bulk calculation and a, you know, molecule calculation is that the K points. So this time you won't be running a calculation using several K points. This time you will only be running a calculation on a single K point that is the gamma K point. And the reason for doing that is because uh, you know the reciprocal space is inverse of the real lattice, right? So the larger is the real lattice, the smaller would be the reciprocal space. So you only, so if we are having a real lattice that is you know 15 angstrom cubic I'm sorry, 15 cubic angstrom in volume, then the reciprocal space is going to be pretty tiny and therefore only a single point would be enough to, you know, sample or map the reciprocal space and therefore in the input file, you will use K points gamma here. So gamma basically corresponds to the 0, 0, 0 origin of the reciprocal space. So we will be using that only. So there are two major differences in regards to the bulk calculation till now that we have figured out that is, uh, you know, the lattice parameters or the lattice is going to be as in, uh, so huge that uh, there is no or there should be enough vacuum region so that there is no interaction between the periodic images and the k points is going to be a single k point calculation and i think that's it so that were the two major differences you know while running the calculation um, using dft um, plane wave dft on a nano cluster and um, what else so the next thing maybe so you can run the SCF calculation of course but of course the first step is going to be the optimization and if you refer to some popular literatures then you can get some idea about what uh, kind of values you are going to need for forces so of course you are not going to need the variable cell option here because it's, you it doesn't matter what you know the lattice parameters are they are imaginary essentially because they are just for our you know calculation purposes they don't mean anything in real life or they don't have any physical significance so you of course won't be using the variable cell configuration however you will be providing some value for the you know force convergence so um, usually in literature you will find the values in electron volts per angstrom and that is usually so, something about 0 0.01 electron volt per angstrom or something like that and that translates to around 3.89 into 10 to the minus 4 you know Rydberg per bore for the quantum espresso input so you won't be using electron volt per angstrom for quantum espresso rather you will be using Rydberg per bore units and uh, here is some you know literature that I found that can be useful so here what you can notice is they say um, ZNS nanoclusters were placed in large supercell with a vacuum region up to 15 angstrom so again see that's exactly what I told you so you have to keep the nanoclusters in a large supercell such as the vacuum region is enough to separate them for, from the periodic images and what they have used for the forces is they have used a criteria of 0 0.04 electron volts per angstrom so and we have set it to 0 0.01 so kind of same 
So essentially it's going to depend on you know the, your computational capacity. If you have a better computational capacity, you should go lower, at least 0 0.01 electron volt per angstrom in my opinion. So, and also they were using CSTA, which is I think a periodic code. And then there are some more calculations. So here, for example, um, you can see these people are using a criteria of two into 10 to the minus three atomic units for the maximum force. So that can be, I think, 0 0.002 Hartree per bore. So if we put 0 0.002 Hartree per bore here, um, then that translates to around four into 10 to the minus three Rydberg per bore. And then here you can see, again, they are using, you know, periodic DFT codes and they have provided the information about um, the largest cluster studied in this study is this and uh, even when we use the supercell of this size then we have a vacuum region of 6 to 7 angstrom so that means um, when a single unit cell has a vacuum region of 6 to 7 angstrom so that means when two uh, such unit cells are kept you know um, side by side then essentially they are getting a separation between the cluster and its images of roughly 14 angstrom so that's the information they are providing here so that is also another important thing that you should know that whenever you are writing a research paper performing a DFT study of a nanocluster or molecule using a PRE DFT code then you should also mention that how did you arrive at the number of for the you know uh, at the separation value for the periodic images and what separation value did you use because it really affects the results and again you can see that they have sampled the reliance zone by a single k point that is gamma point and the convergence criteria they have used is 0 0.001 electron volt per angstrom for forces so that is really tight convergence criteria so you can do that if you have enough computational power at your hands so that is some you know review of literatures and all the information that i had to give you and similarly you can do this for nano clusters or you can even you know create your own input file it doesn't really matter that much so here i have an xyz file file for h2o and then i'll just use bri for you know helping with the creation of your input file however you could do it by your own also the only thing you have to keep in mind is that you use a unit that's a large enough that can separate the periodic images enough to eliminate any periodic interaction between the images and that's it for this tutorial i hope you guys really enjoyed it and in case you have any questions or doubts then leave them in the comment section down below and i'll get back to you and in case you guys enjoyed this tutorial then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this i'll be coming out with a ton of tutorials such as this that can help you a lot in your research thanks for watching and have a great day